Hope doesn't come from stymieing my feeling. The hope comes from feeling and letting myself feel other things, letting myself feel more things, and seeking out what gives me hope and being honest about it. I'm Ruth Evanstein, and I share hope. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. There we go. Hello. That works. That works better. How's it going? I'm good. So I'm I'm getting the top half of your face and this really cool piece of art behind you. Now I got your whole face and more art. Okay, this is, it's film, and like little kids come in and they're like, are those batteries? <laughs> We're like, no. <laughs> like a long, long time ago. That's right. Like, Isn't that cool? Our wedding photographer made that. Like, wow. Back when cameras went click and it wasn't just made by a speaker noise. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, you had to wait to see photos. Yeah, like a week. It was so long. And then you're like, what in the world did I take that picture for? And now, I like, I burst on my iPhone, and I'm like, what in the world did I take 200 pictures of that for? I agree. I know. It's a whole different thing. So I thought, actually, it'd be fun to have that as the background, just because it's funky. But yeah, is it distracting, or is it all right? Oh, no. I think it's super cool. I really love it. So who, an artist gave that to you? The photographer who did, actually, my first wedding and my second wedding, who's an amazing <laughs> sure. guy. Seriously, it was so funny. He's like, 50% discount on second wedding. Ruth, if you're going to third, it's going to be 200% more. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, no, but this guy's a keeper. Forgot, I'm not, tra- I'm not trading him in. My first and second husband sat at the same desk in high school and have the same initials. So, I still use the monogram tiles for my first wedding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Anyway. We went to like his show just because we love the photographer and like we were just going to be supportive. Yeah. And and he's a photographer, but this is one of the things he made and we loved it and we bought it. And <sighs> just it's ours. So. That's so cool. Love it. Yeah. I love yeah. it. It's really a okay. picture. It's a picture of pictures that's not even a picture. Should I, want, me to, you want me to show you? I'll pick I, up yeah, I just really up. can't get over it. It's so cool up close. You'll have to come to Israel and check it out. Look at this. Seriously. So it's some rolls, like the roll canisters. Is it all canisters? Yes. Oh. Yes. Look. Wow. Take you back further. Can you see it? I mean, yeah, I can. And so there's a piece of wood. That's amazing. And there's obviously the stair step diagonal thing going up to the right. Is that supposed yes. to be a skyline? Or does it represent something that I'm? I really want to make sure I get. This. I never asked him. We just were so taken with it that you know we bought it and it stayed at the show and it was like delivered and so many people wanted it after us but you can't even make this now no, where would you get this many rolls of film seriously that's so cool. right i it's love so, that isn't it it's beautiful. it is an awesome it's an yeah, awesome piece. i like textured art that you can actually feel you know it's just really neat and it's got so much history hmm. yes it is really fun is he an artist here in the states or over there where you are He's Israeli, and he's based here, and he's a photographer, actually. Does he ever come to the States and so, do any shows? I should ask him. Mm-hmm. I should ask him. Yeah, that's you know what? I'm tempted to show you some of our... Maybe I'll... You know, I'm, I'm going to take it. I should go show you Let's some other stuff. Tour. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, come. I'll just show you three things. I'm turning my video off so we can make sure we get this. Okay, here. Take a look. So look at this thing of the shoes. It's okay. sideways now because we just switched things around. That's and actually a- your video is still not showing up. Oh, this is killing me. I still want to see this. All right, well, you know, Chris, I'll I'll get you hit connected to him. That sounds here. great. That sounds great. You know, I'll get you connected to him, or I'll even t- I'll even shoot some of these and just send them to you. Perfect. But um, he's on Facebook and he does all kinds of really cool stuff. He's also a wonderful person. That's really so cool. it's, you know, he's like a great artist yeah. doing great art, and he's got a big heart. He's a great guy. That's a great way to say all that. That sounds like a cool guy to meet. Well, I want to yes. meet. I really do. I would love to meet him. And honestly, interesting interviews. I think it's fun talking to artists who who are really doing something to inspire people. And artists often inspire people, I guess. But like you, as a writer, um, but I would love to talk to him. So tell me about this. You are a, a breast cancer survivor. You're really good friends with somebody who's across the Israeli-Palestinian line over on the Palestinian side. Um, yes. And you're a historian. You're a writer. You're, you're seen all over the place for your writing. You're also making a book about your relationship with this friend who you have that's crossed these religious and racial barriers because of fighting breast cancer. The same, the same fight has gone on. 
What, yes. what's, I mean, you've got an enormous amount going on. What set you on the <laughs> journey you're on now? That's, that's like 20 steps that really don't seem very connected, but here you are. Yeah, it's true. Um, they seem disconnected and yet they're eminently connected. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree that perhaps the most compelling hope component of my story is that I was diagnosed with breast cancer five plus years ago while nursing um, my third, my baby, it was my third kid in three years. And on an instinct in my head, went to the surgeon. I felt like something was wrong. I had lost two friends to breast cancer. So really on an instinct, like, you know, like a, you know, someone upstairs sent me a message. Mm -hmm. And, and the breast surgeon sent me for a mammogram. And the guy basically said on the spot, you know, if that's not cancer, my monkey's uncle. And he said, we're going to, biopsy then if the pathology report comes back negative I'll think it's a mistake and I, we almost dropped our baby you know we were so shocked I was 42 years old and so three weeks later I had a lumpectomy and while my scars were still healing you know it was it's it seemed you know that the cancer hadn't spread which was very blessed and mm-hmm. and you know praise the Lord and thank God I went on that instinct in my head mm-hmm. um, my girlfriend sent me an email and said, you know, I went to a Christmas party, met this really nice woman. There's an Israeli-Palestinian breast cancer support group. Would you like to, you know, would you like to get involved? So I thought it was, you know, like a, like a flash of, wow, maybe something amazing, maybe something could come of this. You know, because that felt like a very high level of intimacy. Yeah, seriously. I had moved to Israel 10 days after I graduated from Northwestern. I was very passionate about living here. My mom's a Holocaust survivor. Wow. And she came as a seven-year-old, you know, on a boat, really. Like, my mom's, I'm going to talk about that, too, because my mom is just, you know, hope personified. Mm -hmm. She was three years old in a ghetto and in a concentration camp (laughs) and, you know, walked miles and miles to freedom, and she was under four years old. Wow. So, anyway, at seven, my mom and her parents and her brother, who'd come before them, you know, got on a boat and came to Israel. And so I, I, my mother met my father. Uh, there's a whole story there of my mom growing up in Jerusalem and then meeting my dad from Minnesota. And he fell in love and he fell in love with her first sight and, and proposed to her. And she moved with him to the United States. And I grew up there. But I had been raised to feel very connected to this place. And I had grandparents here. And, you know, biblical, cultural, spiritual, like a real connection to this land that had embraced my family after the Holocaust and after World War II. So I moved here. And in my interest in being in Israel, I was curious about the Palestinians. I didn't really know who the Palestinians were, you know, where they were from, what were they affiliated with, what was their nationality. I really didn't know that much. I was curious. And they actually say that children of Holocaust survivors are disproportionately in helping professions. Really? So, yeah, which is like a fascinating thing. My mother herself, you know, who's a child survivor and the daughter of survivors, she's a psychologist. And I brought to my interest in journalism and writing, etc., a lot of interest in telling stories and connecting with people. And so part of my passion coming to Israel was getting to know who the Palestinians were. And I had attempted a dialogue group in Beit Sahur. But I found it really challenging to meet the women. You know, that piece was really hard to do. Language barrier, my Arabic is pitiful, I barely know anything. (laughs) And so when I got this email, I thought, you know, that's a really strong connection. And I was really in the throes of it at the time. I didn't know if I was going to need chemotherapy. And so I I find out that I missed that meeting. And the next meeting is coming up. And I... In the interim between getting that email, which was in January 2011, and then attending the first meeting, which was March, by that time I discovered I did not need chemotherapy. I had a radiotherapy, you know, radiation, mm. and which I always joke around is like they cover you up when you go to the dentist so you don't get radiation, and like here they're they're doing that, you <laughs> yeah. know, because but like you know like they're with the scalpel and they cut out the cancer, but they want to make sure that you know nothing got lost, like that they didn't mm-hmm. miss any cells. So they radiate you and you, and then I was all done. So now I'm a survivor, Mm -hmm. whatever that means. You know, I, when I do public speaking, I joke around and say, I know what a Holocaust survivor is. And I know the TV show survivor. 
Yeah. But you say, like, what's a breast cancer survivor? Because they tell you that it, God forbid, but it could recur. So what does that mean? So I'm kind of trying to understand what this thing is, that I'm a breast cancer survivor, that it's something. And, uh, and, and, I, and then I'm, it's now the beginning of March, and I don't need chemo, and I'm done with the radiation. And I go to this first meeting. Now, it's held in the West, in West Jerusalem, which is the more Jewish side of, you know, it's really like the Jewish side of Jerusalem. So it's a familiar place. It's close to where I did my, some of my research, my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I walk into this kind of colorless conference room, not so special. And I see 20 or 25 hijabi women, you know, with their heads covered. Sure, yeah. And all different colors, you know, maroon, brown, red. Um, beige, yeah. some greens, like all kinds of funky, beautiful colors beautiful. of hijabs. And they were, yes, and they were wearing abayas, which I didn't know that term at the time. It's kind of like a captain, a long flowing tunic mm -hmm. dresses. Mm -hmm. And they were all talking, moving their hands and, you know, drinking tea, da, 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 da. And there's some Israeli women speaking in Hebrew. And I thought, oh my God, I, I've been living in this country for 20 years and I had to get breast cancer to be in a room with this many Palestinian women. Wow. And he had to get breast cancer to be with me. Mm -hmm. Now, at this, so this is kind of this, this real other in my society, right? You know, Israel, Palestine, even if you don't know that much all about the conflict, you know, they're really on kind of two sides of a divide and right. fighting over land and yeah. God knows what they're fighting over. <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? So you, you know that much. Mm -hmm. And then I have this other strange feeling, which is, but we're all the same in this room. We're all breast cancer survivors. So in that way, all these women and I shared something very fundamental. So I sit down and they do Qigong, which is a Chinese form of meditation and breathing. And every activity was done in two languages, right? There's an interpreter. So in this case, it was in Hebrew and they were interpreting in Arabic. And there was one woman who kept cracking jokes. I didn't understand the jokes. I know a tiny bit of Arabic from studying at Northwestern, but I could tell she was the funny one. And she came up to me at the end. They have, you know, coffee, kind of meet and greet at the end. And she came over and said hi and introduced herself. And she said, my name's Ibtissam Arakat. So I said, you know, Ruth Ebenstein. And I'm thinking, yes, you speak English. I can talk to you. <laughs> I was so psyched. And she starts talking about herself. And she says, you know, my husband Ahmed is quite a few years older than me. And I said, oh, my husband too. And she said, yeah, and, you know, he brought children into the marriage. And I said, my husband, too. I have two stepdaughters. Mm -hmm. And then she said, you know, and I was diagnosed while I was nursing. And I, I was kind of eerie at that moment because it's very uncommon to be diagnosed while you're nursing. If you do feel a lump or anything, then you think it's just milk. Sure. And you don't really look for it. You don't expect it. So that was, you know, if you look up statistics on nursing moms diagnosed with breast cancer, it's very uncommon. It's very uncommon. And, and she told me she had three babies in three years, just like me. Wow. It was shocking. I That's, swear to God. You're I was living parallel for, lives. You know, like it was an elementary school play, you know, just before Christmas. And they have kind of some little angel walking in or, you know what I mean? Like just yeah. before Easter. And because and it was so shocking. Here's this woman who looks so different from me. She's of different religion. She lives on the other side of the wall. You know, there's this separation barrier through parts of the West Bank and, and you know, parts of, of Israel and Palestine separated. Mm -hmm. And and so she has just my life story. It was just shocking. And she was also funny. She also felt somewhat familiar in her personality. She was funny. She was kind of cracking jokes and very friendly and very open, which I, I am as well. So that was really intriguing and kind of exciting. You know, even I'd say like a little bit exhilarating because it was kind of like, oh my goodness, like cancer is about something besides just am I going to die? Something terrible going to happen to me. Yeah. And, you know, so this little van comes to pick up the Palestinian women and she squeezes my hand and says, you know, I'll see you next time. It's been great. And when I walked my car, it's like I, I realized I'm really thinking about her. And I was kind of remembering some terms I'd studied in Arabic. And it just kind of joggled my mind and and made me think about something besides being a breast cancer survivor. And I was I was quite obsessed and scared because I'd lost two friends to the and, and I was about their age. So it was very frightening. And, and this was something else. Mm. This was something else coming out of cancer. Now 
what's incredible is that she is now like a sister to me. We are very, very dear friends. And, you know, our, our families are friends. And, and my mom calls her from Michigan. And it kind of in an extended way, we've become a large family. So even, just talk to her. I was wondering that. So even your families have accepted your relationship with her in an open way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, our, my, my sons were complaining, like, when are we going back to Abu Dhis? You know, they want to go visit her because her kids. Her, and, and it's not that our kids are the same age. My kids are six, six and a bit, eight and nine and a half. And hers are teenagers, you know, they're 15, 17, and 18, yeah. you, know, you know, something like that. So it's not that the kids are the exact same age, but I wonder if on some subterranean level they know we've been through something similar. You know, my kids don't really remember. You know, my youngest was, was really, you know, I mean, they were all, it was three little kids under five, so they were small. But they know something, and and they really act with her children like they do with my my sister, you know, my sister's sister's children. Mm-hmm. They feel them and they hang out with them. And my mom calls her from Michigan and her family also is very embracing of me, her mother too. I remember when she told her in Arabic, you know, she's Jewish, you know, and she's, she's Israeli. And her mom gave me this look of like, welcome, you know, welcome in my home. Mm-hmm. It was, and it's, it just to give, um, you know, just to give our, our listeners a sense we really wouldn't have met each other because she needs a permit to cross an eight foot separation barrier, which is administered by the Israeli government. So, so, I mean, I'm not going to get into a whole security thing here because it's not really about that. It's, it's that without illness, we wouldn't know each other, mm-hmm. you know, without this. And blessedly now she's over 50, so she doesn't need a permit anymore to get across and, and we, you know, no matter what's going on in the headlines, you know, we're family. We are family. So that's just. That's a great start, a great explanation, first of all, for where you are and where you've come from. Thank you. And, and a, great, a great bit of encouragement for me. So this whole I Share Hope project came out of me trying to find hope and, and hopefully getting to hang out with people who are actually doing something with hope because of coming through some really hard uh, stuff in my past. Mine happens to be a, a really abusive story of childhood sexual abuse from, from my, my home that I was born into. But, but I so often feel like I get stuck in the role of being a survivor and I want to be a mm-hmm. thriver. I want to be something besides a survivor, right? You don't want to get yes. stuck in that spot. But the, what you said about, you know, this, this thing of being a survivor, whatever that means, has really been a ticket for you to get into other people's lives and for you to meet new people, see new places, and build some relationships that you'd never been able. It's really, it's really been a, a gift in some ways, not just a, whoa, what if it comes back? Or, boy, that was hard. You know? I think that's yes. really cool. It's very forward, and it gives you something to do with all that. Yes. Yes, it has. And it's, it's very humbling. I think that, you know, and Chris, as you as someone who's been through hard things as well, I think people who've struggled or suffered or have had to pull themselves up because life has not been a straight line, all understand each other. Now, all of us are going to face difficult things. And the question is, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? Because it is in our power to do something mm-hmm. with it. Yeah, you're right. It's it's just, it's a choice. It's a choice. I could have chosen to feel sorry for myself mm-hmm. all the time. I could have said, how did this happen? I'd want to have another baby. Couldn't do that. I've lost a bunch of lymph nodes, and so now I'm scared to go on safari in Africa because I don't want to get lymphedema and have my arm blow up and, mm-hmm. and this and that and the other. You know, yeah. I could go harp on all the doors that have closed as a result of this. Or I could talk about all the doors that have opened. And like you said, it's a cascade of doors that have opened. You know, uh, in addition to this incredible experience, this Israeli-Palestinian sisterhood that has, is, you know, developed in my life, which is beyond just my relationship with Ibtissam, although that's the really by far the closest one. We traveled as part of a delegation that Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure sponsored. An Israeli-Palestinian delegation traveled to Bosnia-Herzegovina. Mm-hmm to meet other women who cross cultural, religious, and ethnic lines to support each other. Wow. 
And so, yeah, so we met women from Bosnia, you know, and just to remind folks, you know, in the 90s, there was a civil war there. And so the Bosnians and the Serbians and the Croatians, who are three different, you know, it's three different religions, people who lived together and married each other and were all just one big happy family started killing each other. I mean, after Yugoslavia broke into independence, so horrible things happened there. And there is now, you know, it's a country of 3 million people with 13 health ministries. There's still kind of some, some undertones of things going on between the different religious groups, etc. cetera. And, and the, the thinking was, let's bring together these women from conflict regions who have also fought breast cancer. It was incredible. Wow. You know, I, I, everyone, everyone listening to this podcast can tell that I'm quite the verbal person. And, I, you know, we needed two interpreters to translate the whole, all the conversations. But I felt such connections with these women. I felt so strongly connected to them. I felt, I, I mean, I really felt the universality of the humankind. You know, it, it was just incredible. And I'm still in touch with these women on Facebook. Really, they don't know English. I, I, I certainly don't know Bosnian you know, we somehow write to each other, little Google Translate, whatever. But there was this keen understanding of, of having thought disease and living in regions where people kill each other and for what. So there, we really got each other. So, And this has extended beyond, you know, um, I'm writing a memoir about what has happened to me, you know, about cancer. I mean, the arc of the book is illness, friendship, reassessment. You know, how this changed the way I see other and how did this way this change the way I see the world. That's powerful. So that's real and honest and powerful. And I really respect that. Thank you. You're welcome. Like, seriously, few people are that honest and that real and that vulnerable because it is hard. And I I don't blame people for not being more vulnerable in that sense, because it's really hard and you have to calculate those risks sometimes. But you're really stepping out there. And that's breast cancer is not my issue. But as somebody with issues, the people who have been verbal ahead of me have just become heroes of mine. So thank you for being a hero already. <laughs> wow, thank you. I, I just feel like a person trying to make something of it. But hmm. if I can inspire others to, to open up and, and look beyond what's right in front of you then I will feel that I have done, you know, I have done my job. I have, I have shared this because certainly our goal is to pass on what we've learned through our struggles to others who can benefit from these lessons without the struggles. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that would be my hope for others to share the hope that I've gleaned from this, these deep understandings that I have, have come to through illness you know, folks, you know, grab them without the illness. Really, yeah. the person who looks so different from you is just like you. Oh, you're right. You're right. Just that even that person who's hijabi and you can only see the little eye slits and you think, oh, my goodness, you know who's under that, per- that hijabi? A person mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like you. When you're all wrapped up in the snow, you look the same. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more colorful, you know. Yeah. Maybe it's easier to eat spaghetti. But that's not it's you know the same. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, well here it is. You got to answer our five questions, and I think you might have already answered one or two of them, but you can reference back. Um, so okay. let's go for number one. So number one, what is your definition or your favorite quote or your your belief about hope? Any way that you want to phrase that up. Okay. So I, I found a quote, actually, it was funny, I looked today for a quote, quote, and then I'm going to give y'all some just my general thoughts. I found this quote by Robert H. Schuler: let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. I think that really applies to all of us. Now, what I would say is the mantra that I grew up with in my family is that things don't have to be perfect to be really good. Perfection doesn't exist. I grew up in a family that doesn't believe in hanging on to anger and resentment. I mean, my mom's a super hopeful person, even though she was a, 
you know, in a concentration camp at three years old. So just kind of looking at the goodness around you and and enlarging it, you know, stretch it. Like like a little kid takes, you know, blows balloons on, on, on the porch or out in the field yeah. and you can kind of blow the bubble and see all the colors and it's, and, and it just gets bigger and bigger and it's kind of tender and, you know, like that. Take those little things and you blow out and that, that's your hope. At least that's my hope. That's awesome. You're really encouraging me already. This is really great. This is why I'm doing this project. I get so much out of this. I know that so many people that are listening along with me are just learning and taking notes like I am. But wow, I love this. Okay, so question two. <laughs> Who has... Who's invested that kind of hope in your life? Sounds like mom definitely has. Is there, and that could be the best example that that's really pouring into you or has in the past. I mean, I think my mom has survived a lot of adversity and is very optimistic and has definitely modeled a lot of hope for me. She's, as I mentioned earlier, she's a psychologist and she said she went, went, once went to a conference about people, you know, trauma survivors, and she was in all the groups. You know, she'd been like attacked, yeah. been, you know, she'd been through, and she was like, oh, I've had that, and I've had that, and I've had that. But you know what? I didn't even know that as a child growing up. I didn't know the extent of the things that she's been through, and um, it's informed her experience, but she's not a bitter, angry person at all. She's a hopeful person and a happy person. Um, so I, I kind of feel like it's part of our DNA and part of the climate that I grew up with in in. in in my household, mm -hmm. who inspires hope. This yeah. might sound hokey, but my husband's love and acceptance for me inspires a lot of hope. Mm, sweet. In me. Yeah. And yeah, like really someone who's the wind beneath your wings and believes in you. Mm. I think that most of us are blessed to have that. I think for those of us who don't have that, you can vote yourself to be that person too. Mm. Good point. Great point. Question three. Tell us about a time when you've really had to lean on that hope you're talking about to pull through. And you've already talked quite a bit about your story. So anywhere you want to go with that or add or, or reference back to anything, feel free. Okay. You know, I'm, I may say that, um, you know, a lot of aspects of my life went the way that I wanted them to, but I had trouble finding my special someone and I got married late in life. I was 34 the first time I got married, and and really, like, a week into the marriage, it was kind of like, uh-oh, this isn't going so well. And we got divorced after a year and a half. Now, funnily enough, my first husband and my second husband went to the same high school and sat at the same desk, and they have the same initials in their names. So I still use them on <laughs> grandma for the first marriage. I'm, I'm not making that up. I mean, mom was a Holocaust survivor. I'm not going to waste. So like, they're beautiful <laughs> Well, it sounds but, like you almost found the right guy the first time. You were so close, just one seat over, you know? Oh, gosh, Chris, seriously, in Judaism, they say before a child is born that God kind of points down, you know, and is, has found your special someone. And I guess I couldn't tell which way he was pointing, you know, at the desk, because <laughs> it's just from heaven. It's just so hard to see. <laughs> it's a long way. So, you know, actually, when I met my husband, yeah, I, um, I, I asked him, I said, did anyone else sit at the desk? Because... If anyone else is my, you know, special someone, I want to know right now because forget it. Like, I'm not, I got to know. <laughs> I don't right. want to this up. But uh, at that time, I felt hopeless for a while. I was scared that I wouldn't, I wouldn't get to have children. That's what really frightened me. You know, I really feared missing that chance. And, 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 and my mother was extremely helpful and just supporting me there so kind of having a mom psychologist was, was very, very helpful. And so I let myself feel sad and I went with that and then I picked myself up and said, you know, I'm going to have a family. So somehow, either with someone on my own, I'm going to make it happen and I'm going to have a family. And so that letting myself feel bad, but then tabling it and reminding myself how resilient we are as human beings how, that that as hard as today may feel today's going to end and you're going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be a new day and we really have the power to do something new every day just like how our cells are regenerating all the time like we can do that and 
look at look at look at my breast cancer experience, right? You got a mom with three tiny little kids who gets breast cancer and they tell you it can always recur. So great, you know, it's starting up 42, you know, gosh, that's pretty scary. However, through that illness, met an incredible woman, which has given me hope about the universe, not just about my life and my friendship. It makes me believe that that's possible for all of us. So, you know, that's hope helping me and, and you know what? In both cases, it's worked out. I met my husband, and he proposed after a day and a half. You know, we went out wow. Sunday night. Seriously. Wow. And we went out Sunday night. Tuesday morning, he proposed. He said, I was going to ask last night, but I know you like the hard-to-get guy. And I'm thinking, <laughs> dude, that's not really hard to get. Dude, that's a day and a half. But, but you know, it's, we are very happily married. I adore his girls. We were blessed with fertility and had three kids in, in three years, like I said. And just, you know, life has thrown us a couple curveballs and things that, you know, didn't expect cancer, certainly. But here we are. We're together and we're madly in love and things are going well for us and for our family. Our, and we have a very beautiful blended family. Hmm. So, again, I just say resilience and, and, and taking your magnifying glass and shining the light on the things that are good and hugging them with your heart oh. and to your heart. And wow. will give you a lot. This is really well. great. So great. I can't tell you how much I need to hear this today. I, I mean that sincerely. This is not just for the record. I really, I really did. So thank you. Wow. This is so great. I was meeting with my therapist this morning and had a really hard, about a really hard 10 days probably. And, um, and yesterday was particularly dark, and I was looking forward to this interview because I knew it would just help me. You know, I've been working real hard to refocus my attention on those brighter spots in my life the past um, 10 days or so, and it's nice to hear somebody else express that. Thank you. Hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm glad. You're I'm glad. Right. You're right is the point, and that's good for me to hear and good for me to acknowledge. You are absolutely right in what you're saying. No. I, I do want to say what, you know, what I said, I, I want to kind of underscore or highlight that I think we need to go with the feelings when we feel bad. I think that's, I think feeling bad, you know, there, there's right, there's, there's a certain healing that happens when you cry, when you let yourself feel sad. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's letting go of the hope. I think that's letting ourselves feel the sadness. Mm -hmm. Why did this bad thing happen to me? You know, and that, and it's it's hard not to go to that place, but then you just say like have that feeling, feel it, let it you know outgas it, and then pick yourself up mm -hmm. and say you know that happened to me, and and but now there are all these other things that can happen to me and will happen to me. I also found sustenance and hope in approaching others who had stories that that gave me strength. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. I've got a girlfriend who had like a, I don't even know what stage brain tumor 25 years ago. And she survived it all. And when I was feeling particularly blue, I invited her over. She brought some split pea soup and we did the laundry together. And she told me her story. And, and she's kind of, I think now there are a few more people, but many people, there are many people in the world who've survived as long as she has. So that's kind of another way to get hope. I mean, that's part of the whole uh, of this whole project. Yes, is on those days when you're feeling down, to to remind yourself of how many of us have faced adversity, pulled ourselves together, and come out with with some gift that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Now, I'm not saying, oh gosh, I'm so glad I got cancer because. <laughs> It's not that yeah. I got cancer and it's going to happen to everybody. Everybody's got something right. that's going to happen. I can't, I haven't scripted. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm not God. I'm not Darwin. I don't know any of that. Mm -hmm. I just know it's going to happen. And, and, and we have to kind of prepare ourselves for it. Remind ourselves about our, our strength, surround ourselves with the things that will help us. Mm -hmm and feed our hope. And for each person, that may be something else. You right. know, for some people, it's chocolate, for some people, it's exercise. For some people, it's it's getting on a boat and sitting, you know, in a body of water and, sure. and breathing. But, yeah. but having the hope that you can give yourself that, and you will. I wish you it will. was chocolate for me, because that would be really awesome. 
(laughs) 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 Yeah, it's true. You know, it's kind of see the good side of being a chocoholic. But Chris, if you're not that into chocolate, you're protecting yourself from diabetes. (laughs) You know, it's just, it's one. (laughs) It's true. Something's going to get you. Plus your faith, you know? It's all good. It's all good. All right, question four. So how are you uh, sharing hope today? What are you doing in and around your life that's bringing hope to you and others? And again, you're given as like, you've already given me 10 points, so I just love it. (laughs) Give me a few more. What am I doing to share hope? Yeah, let me tell you what I'm doing. I actually... It's funny because I was thinking, and I won't say how much time we have because I was maybe going to read my little Jewish Christmas story because that's a... Oh, cool. You know what? So we got like 10 more minutes. You think we can get that in another question in? Yes, we can. Well, I don't know if I should... Should I? Yeah, let me read it because it's not that long. This is an example of how I share hope. Can I read? Can I share the story? I would love this. Thank you. Okay. And and we got the video going too, right? So folks, this appeared in USA Today. The video is just not cranking right now. It's just sitting there i don't know why i see your initials re I'm okay so sad. but but can the christmas can the story not the christmas story but can the story go on without the pictures or do we need those sure because sure. i want to get I mean, this i could call you back and get um I, yeah do you want to call me back let me call you right back video? we'll patch this all together yeah let me call you right back and see if i can get this thing turned back on hang on okay okay We're I'm, back. Not, I'm not okay. even going to touch my video so that oh it's on let me turn mine off i don't want to mess up yours okay okay we're ready. Okay, great. So you it's, just asked how again. I share hope you know, today. It's, it's off again, Ruth. It's uh, the video just went away. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> okay, it's fine. We might want to skip the book, unless Pardon we, me? we can skip the book unless you think it'll really help. Um, unless we can do it without the video. We can do it without the video. I mean, it's just a great little story. But I, I love it. Um, Let's hear it. I love the stories. I know this is such a good story. I think I'm going to read it because it's a story. And the truth is, I can. Um, the photo, I can just send you the photo well, from Christmas. So, Perfect. all right. Um, I'm going to answer the question and I'll read this quickly. And, and we also have time to get our last question in too. So you asked how I share hope today. And I'm going to answer that by one of the ways I do it is by public speaking. I, I go to different churches and, and uh, interfaith groups, synagogues, Muslim groups, um, hospitals, universities, uh, high schools, you name it. And I share the story of my friendship with Ibtissam. I've also shared some of the health activism and peace activism that have emerged as a result. Because uh, I've, I've done other things as a result of, of uh, being a cancer survivor that have emerged from that. And, and I also, I'm a writer. That's my, my way of reaching out to people. And it's also a way of just making sense of the world to myself. So I'm going to share a short story that I wrote for USA Today and ran um, Christmas Eve 2015, and, and um, this, is an, this is really a, a great hope story, I believe. On Christmas Eve 1944, my grandmother urged my uncle, then 12 years old, to sneak out of the concentration camp where they, imprisoned, they were imprisoned at Strasov, nearly 15 miles east of Vienna, to go begging. People are charitable around Christmas time, Grandma Lily said to her son, Juri, that's George in Hungarian, ask for scraps, anything they can spare. Tell them that we're on the verge of starvation. Tell them that your three-year-old sister cannot get off the bed because she's outgrown her shoes. I don't want to beg, retorted the boy. I'd rather steal. That's wrong, scolded his mother. We are not thieves. They argued back and forth. After a time, her son acquiesced. In the dark of night, Juri snuck out of the camp between two wooden slats and walked nearly four miles to Deutschwagram, the closest town, shivering in his tattered clothing because they were sent, you know, in the summer to the concentration camp, so it's winter, but he's got his summer clothes. On the outskirts, he happened upon a house, secluded from the others. He walked up the path and knocked on the front door. A woman opened that door. She was probably alone, her man far away, fighting in the war, her children asleep in their beds. And it's likely that she suspected that the young boy was Jewish. The 12-year-old pieced together in German exactly what his mother had told him to say. Did he hide his ambivalence about begging? Did he charm her even then with his gift of gab? Come back tomorrow, whispered the woman. The next day, my uncle returned. The woman opened the door with a smile. 
She piled his hands with bread, clothing, a pair of shoes that her child had had grown, had outgrown, and a pair of socks. The woman had knit warm woolen socks for my mother. Nestled in socks and shoes that fit, my mother scooted in the scooted off the bed in delight. Her ragged shoes were passed on to a younger child who was also living in the camp. My mother joined her mother and older brother in feasting on the provisions they were given. They shared their unexpected bounty with the entire barracks. It was a quiet celebration of human kindness around Christmas time. In April 1945, my mother, uncle, and grandmother were liberated by the Russians. And it was those very socks and shoes that my mother wore as she trekked some 28 miles over two days to Bratislava on her walk to a new life. She was three months shy of four years old. Grandma Lily had a gorgeous laugh and a mischievous sense of humor, even during the Holocaust. She used to tease my mom. Can you know, can, oh, sh one second, Chris. No worries. Okay, Ruth? Alarm clock that doesn't work. <laughs> you have to take the batteries out? Yes. I can, I can hear all that going in the background. I thought, she's, she's, I thought it was a smoke alarm or something. I was like, <laughs> her house yeah, is going to burn down. She's taking the batteries out. <laughs> That's so crazy. So I'm going to go back to, um, she was three months child. I'll go, go, I'll go back to April 1945. Yeah, so we don't have... I'm really fascinated with this. Keep going. In April 1945, my mother, uncle, and grandmother were liberated by the Russians. And it was those very socks and shoes that my mother wore as she trekked some 28 miles over two days to Bratislava on her walk to a new life. She was three months shy, four years old. Grandma Lily had a gorgeous laugh and a mischievous sense of humor. Even during the Holocaust, she used to tease my mom, you can tell folks that you spent your childhood in the Vienna woods to the anonymous righteous Gentile. I thank you. Thank you for knitting with your hands the pair of socks that warmed my mom's little feet and skinny legs. Thank you for finding those shoes and clothing and giving them to a stranger. Thank you for sharing your bread during wartime. In the despair of a battered land, cold and snowy, when many hearts were closed and evil reigned and death was more likely than life, especially for Jews, you gave them light. You gave them kind-heartedness. You gave them a measure of sustenance that I can only imagine. If you had not looked past the years of poisonous hatred and anti-Semitism that had enveloped your country in order to rally to help my family, would they have survived to tell this story? So, Wow. Right? I mean... Wow. A, a Jewish Christmas story. A true Jewish Christmas story. Yeah, for real. Concentration camp. Wow. By a woman, yeah, who didn't know my family, who was never recognized. She knit my mom's socks that my mom wore to freedom. Oh, my goodness. I wish you could find that lady. I know. I've thought of it, actually. I kind of have a fantasy of going back there and looking for her. Wow. My mother's the only one to survive. You know, um, I will... We'll be able to add in the, the photo. We have an, an authentic original photo from 1946 huh. of my mom. And you can see her skinny little legs with her mom and her dad and her brother. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, so talk about hope, right? Please talk send about, me that picture. Yeah. yeah. Talk about hope. Wow, that's incredible. Right? So, so question five. You've answered really well how you're sharing hope today. And what a background. What a heritage. <laughs> to tell us with question five, how do we share hope today or grow in hope? What are the simple ABCs? Somebody who's just starting out trying to gain a little ground on this thing. What next? When we hang up this phone call, what do I do next? 
Well, how, what, do we, what are the little things we do? I, I would kind of say to every, every person, close your eyes and find a moment where you felt joy. Not necessarily hope, but joy. And, and we all have it. It could be when you went swimming or the first time you bit into a candy bar or saw a movie, heard a song. Find that moment for yourself and visit it. Go to all the senses. What does it smell like? What does it taste like? How does it feel on your skin? The light in, in, in the room or outside, wherever you are. And, and take it and, and kind of hug it. You know, take it into yourself, that, those, that little moment that feels good for you. And call that your hope moment that you kind of carry around in your pocket that makes you feel good. That a moment where you knew you were good, where you felt the joy, where you didn't ask if you felt hope, you were the hope. Like that you were the good feeling, you were that joy. I think that we all have that. We all have that. Afterwards, maybe we've been through other things that have polluted that or taken it up or whatever, but we can go back there. It's ours. Now, I'm a writer, I'm a writer, so I take those moments, like I said, and I do kind of this sensory thing with it. But I, I think all of us can, can get a lot of sustenance from that. Hmm. I truly believe. I think each one of us, each one of us has, has a, a person, some of us have persons and some of us have moments with a person where we felt good, we felt seen and recognized. And I would say take that also and put it in your other back pocket. So one is that moment, and the other is kind of that person or interaction where you felt good. And if you haven't been blessed with an outside person, and it's where you felt that unadulterated love and acceptance for yourself, then put you, that you in that moment in your other back pocket. And then put your two palms in those back pockets and hold on to them. They're yours. And you kind of get up. And you kind of do the, I think I can, I think I can. That little engine, you know, the story of I think I can, I think I can, the little engine that could is, that engine did not expect to be able to do that job. But, but with that faith and that push, you pick yourself up and you find it's possible. It, it's just, you know, pick yourself up. We... We are more resilient than we think we are. We all have goodness in us, and we all have love, and we all are created in the same way. We're all the same. We are. And I, you know, after I had my first child, I looked at every person and thought, oh, my God, you came out of someone, and you came out of someone, and you came out of someone. <laughs> you know, really. Yeah, that's true. And it's just take yourself to those primary places and, 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 and trust yourself in your ability to make those sensory moments come alive and to wrap yourselves up in them. You know, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a blanket. Yeah. It's a blanket. You know, I, I'm sitting here, as I'm sure lots of people are who are listening along with me, and I've got a hand in each back pocket, my eyes closed, and I'm just... I've just got those two, that, that really good moment and that really good relationship. And, and I'm, really, uh, I'm really with you there. I, I could sit and listen to you read and talk and <laughs> read your writings just all day long. And unfortunately, this whole podcast thing keeps us a little bit limited. <laughs> um, but it's also me, good. It's also good because folks got a lot to do. Well, too. we do, I guess. But people, you know, it's amazing we listen to what we want to. And people do. So I'm sure that everybody listening along with me right now is just so grateful for your time. So Ruth, so we don't have to quit. How can we find you? Social media, websites, where are you out there? Yes. Well, I, folks, I would love to be in touch with you. I, 
it's really important to me. I became a journalist because I love people and I love their stories and I truly care. I really am excited and and curious. So I have a web I, I have a few different things. On Facebook I have a page called Laugh Through Breast Cancer Dash Ruth Evanstein. So my name spelled R U T H E B E N S T E I N. So you know, please like that. On Twitter, it's at Ruth Ebenstein, you know, um, again, R-U-T-H-E-B-E-N-S-T-E-I-N. And and my website is laughthroughbreastcancer.com. And I just, you know, right now, I just put out whatever writings and things that I have, I post them. And um, I'm also on Google Plus or LinkedIn or whatever those things are. But I, I just keep up with these kinds of writings and and seek to to emphasize hope, to shine light on that. I post a lot of hopeful things on my Facebook pages because that's what's really important to me. You know, this whole idea of, it's not just, cancer also changed the way I see others of all sorts. You know, I'm very active now in organizations also that do inclusion, embracing people with and without special needs. It's like, it's it's kind of a holistic approach of, we, it is the family of man, woman, humankind. We are all in this together. We're all people. So I'm close in particular to the issues that I'm dealing with, living in Israel, you know, and, and, and in the Middle East and, and the conflicts of that. But then this has opened doors to lots of other communities and, and groups and I'm open and eager to learn and hear about what other people are doing and see if there's anything from my experience that can help them with theirs and if there's anything from our experiences here that can give sustenance and support and guidance the other way. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm working on my book and hope to get that out. I think the memoir will be called something like Ibtissam and I, um, you know, an unexpected friendship across the Israeli-Palestinian divide, you know, born, you know, towards oh, yeah. breast cancer. I'm not sure yet, but uh, something like that and maybe even a children's book about it as well to educate young folks huh. about how we embrace other. But definitely please, please keep in touch and, and write to me and share your stories. And if there's anything that I can add that's helpful, even on a personal level, I would welcome that. I am sure just based on how this audience that's that's me included interacts with our guests. I'm sure you'll get lots of interaction on this. Thank you so much for sharing hope and for being so brave and out there to share your story and to cross a lot of lines, not just um, breast cancer survivor lines, but you've done so much more with something that seems to be a tragedy for a lot of people. You've actually turned it into way more good than bad. It's amazing. Uh, So one last thing here. I need a recording of you. We asked each of our guests this. Say your name and I share hope because we like to start the interviews off with that. Um, a little quote from you and then your name and I share hope. So I'll be quiet and let you say that. Wait, should I say oh, the quote of, uh, the quote about that I, they start off with the guest quote? I know you had this written down, right? Let your hopes, not your hopes, shape your future. Say that or first say my guest name and I share hope and then quote. Why don't you say your guest name and I share hope? And then say your other quote as well. We can take these clips and move them around. You know how it works. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm Ruth Evanstein, and I share hope. Great. Now tell me your quote again. Read it just one more time. Your um, the quote that you started your episode yes. with. Yeah. Let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. Robert A. Schuler. I'm glad you reread that because that one stuck on my brain as well. Man, that's good. Yeah. That's a really good quote. Yeah, it is. It's very simple, but it's mm-hmm. it's you know it's it's pregnant with meaning because mm-hmm. it, it, it really it's it, it it's you know you know from your experience it, it's what are you going to do with it? Yeah. It's there. You don't. It, it's not a pencil. You can't erase it. Right. But you you can decide what you're going to do with it. Right. There is a next. There is a next. And I get to decide if it's a good one or a bad one. Right. Yeah. Right. And, but, and not, and, and again, I, for me, it's important to say, like, it's not about not feeling. Because it's not that. It's not, it's, the hope doesn't come from styming my feelings. Mm-hmm. 
The hope comes from feeling and letting myself feel other things, letting myself feel more things, and and seeking out what gives me hope and being honest about it. Yes. Because what gives me hope may not be the same thing as what gives someone else hope. And and I get to choose what's the right thing for me. Mm-hmm. Great point. Yeah. And, and, and I should, that's self-preservation. Yeah. That really is. So that's why people will be putting different things in their back pockets. Mm-hmm. They really will. Yeah. And that's okay. That's, that's actually good. That's healthy. That's hopeful. It is. You, you know, that you choose what's your honest, you know, your honest feel-good item. Yeah. It's, you know, and it, it could be someone else might consider it dark or inappropriate or... I don't care. Whatever. If yeah. you hope, stick it in there and keep your palm on it. No kidding. Great <laughs> closing words. <laughs> Ruth, thank you again for your time. You're a treasure. You really are. <laughs> Thanks, it's been Chris. A privilege. And I look forward to talking to you soon, very soon, I hope. Great. Well, okay. yeah, how did, I, mean, I like to have a million questions of how I got this whole thing going. I mean, it sounds great. And I wish gosh. I had more time right now and I could tell you all about it, but. I really do have to go. I know you yeah, do you too. You probably to the next person. So well, thank you for being part of this project. I really do appreciate oh my it. Gosh. It's such a pleasure, and you take care. Okay. And I'm glad it was. Well, I'll send you stuff if I got anything good. Please do, Ruth. All right, thanks. Okay. And I'll send you this photo. I can't okay. wait to see it. All right, bye bye. Cheers. Be bye. well. Bye bye. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.